2,000 years ago, on the shores of Northwest Europe, lived a tribe called the Anglii, ancestors of the English-speaking peoples. The Roman historian Tacitus said they were one of seven tribes who sacrificed to the goddess Mother Earth by drowning people in bogs. In Denmark, more recently, the descendants of those people, digging for peat, have made some remarkable discoveries. Victims of these tribes have been perfectly preserved in the bog. This man was strangled. This man's throat was cut. It's hard to imagine that the language of this savage people would one day become the most widely spoken in the world. A Hindu temple might seem a strange place to start the story of English. But chanting in the holy language, Sanskrit, these worshippers are closer to English than you might imagine. Our word divine resembles their word deva. The surprising connection between English and Sanskrit was discovered at the end of the 18th century by a British judge stationed in Calcutta, Sir William Jones. Jones found that the English father resembles the Sanskrit pita, the Greek pater, and the Latin pater. Other basic words like mother, three, me, new, and seven convinced Jones that they were all part of the same language family. Perhaps as old as Stonehenge, the prehistoric origins of what Jones called this common source are as remote and obscure as this Neolithic ruin. This common source is the parent of what scholars call the Indo-European group of languages. Reaching out as far as India and the Hebrides, it's given us European languages like Latin and its descendants French and Spanish, the Celtic languages of Ireland, Scotland and Wales, the Slavic languages of Russia and Poland, and the Germanic tongues like Danish, Dutch, and English. The Indo-Europeans probably lived in Central Europe. Gradually, the Germanic tribes, the ancestors of English, moved westwards. Eventually settling along the shores of Northern Europe, they included the Jutes, Angles, Saxons, and Frisians in what is now Denmark, Germany, and Holland. Today, there are still 300,000 Frisian speakers in northern Holland. Martin Sittema speaks a language that is often closer to English than Dutch, closer still to Old English. It's so close, there's even a rhyme that works in both languages. It goes, good butter and good cheese are good English and good Frise. Most people associate Friesland with cows. They might be surprised to know that Frieslanders use the same word. That is go. And the words for bread or lamb. That is a lamb. And for wheat, sheep, or goose. That is an, uh, 
goes. And ox or foal? And in a faller. And how about house or boat? It's in a boat. And similar words for fork, bull or pole? It's in a pail. And corn or dung? It's in tonga. And green or rain? It's in a rain. And even a cup of coffee? A cup of coffee. The English language arrived in Britain in A.D. 449. The invading Frisians, Angles, Saxons and Jutes spoke closely related languages which came to be known as Anglo-Saxon. In the words of the chronicler, Angles and Saxons came from the east. Across the broad sea they sought Britain. Sie dann erst an Hider, Engle an Siaxa up bekommen, auf verbrade Brimmu, Brutunu sochton. Proud warmongers overcame the strangers. The mighty earls conquered the land, eager for glory. Ulonko wies midas, welchas of verkommen, eorlas archwate, eorde bejeatan. Britain had recently been abandoned by the Romans, leaving the Celtic inhabitants to look to their own defences. Porchester was part of a defensive chain built by the Romanized Britons because of the growing frequency of Saxon attacks, so frequent that this coast came to be known as the Saxon Shore. Perhaps the most successful resistance to the Anglo-Saxons was mounted by one Artorius, the legendary King Arthur. But in the long run, the Anglo-Saxons were unstoppable. In the bloody wars that ensued, the native Britons were driven into the forests and hills of the West. There was so little cultural contact that English, which is borrowed from virtually everyone, took fewer than a dozen words from the original Britons. The final insult was that the Anglo-Saxons called the people they had conquered the Wielas, meaning foreigners, from which we get Wales. The names of Celtic rivers, Avon, Thames, and places like Kent and Dover have survived. And a few words for unfamiliar landscape features like coombe for valley and crag for high rock were borrowed by the invaders. When the Anglo-Saxons invaded, the Celts fled in many directions to Ireland, France, and to Wales. The Celtic Britons were also part of the Indo-European language tree. Echoes of their language are heard in modern Welsh. The Celts who fled from Britain to France called their new homeland Brittany. Jean Leroux is a Breton-speaking onion seller from Brittany who still makes an annual visit to Wales. Breton and Welshmen speak varieties descended from the same Celtic language. Even today, these Celtic cousins still use words that are common to both languages. Another Celtic tradition is the making of coracles. Peter and Ronnie Davis prefer to discuss their ancient craft in Welsh, and when they speak English, it's with strong Welsh accents. My family's been fishing with coracles for about 300 years. Well, uh, you just can't pick it up at once. For somebody who doesn't know anything about it, it always turns round and goes round in circles. 
Well, the net we use, you see, has got rings across the top and a rope going through them. So when a fish hits the back of the net, we just close the net, pull the rope, and it closes, and the fish is in the bag then. The characteristics of the English spoken by the Welsh are the rolled R, the clear vowels, the hesitant consonants, and the lilting inflections. All this makes up the music of Welsh English. So when you finish the shot you're doing, you can carry it back, and it's uh, used because of the lightness of the craft to carry it back. But I'm not making them all the time. I enjoy making them, that's all. I make a couple every year. Just to keep the tradition going of a coracle. Celtic Wales was united with Anglo-Saxon England in the 16th century. Today, the country is officially bilingual. This Celtic past influences the writing of Elinid Phillips, twice winner of the Eisteddfod crown for poetry. You can always tell when a Welshman is writing in English because of the flamboyance of their descriptions as a rule. I think that comes down from the Celt because the old Celtic warriors used to go into battle not only with terror in their veins but with, with red-hot waves of ecstasy. And I think that comes out um, clearly in the writing, in the, the Welsh-English writing. For generations, the Celtic languages have been fighting for survival in France, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. That survival is threatened by English. Only 20% of the population now claim Welsh as a first language, and most of them live in the country. There's no escaping the Welsh need for English to get on in everyday life. Even this sheepdog, Vic, has been trained to answer calls in Welsh and English to increase his market value. But although the extinction of Welsh has often been predicted, it survives a lingering reminder of Britain's Celtic past. The Welsh language survives because more than a thousand years ago it was excluded by the Anglo-Saxons who built this defensive ditch along what became the border between England and Wales. It symbolizes the gulf between the Celtic and Anglo-Saxon cultures. In England itself, the invaders settled into several kingdoms, Northumbria, Mercia, Kent, and Wessex, dividing the country along accent lines which survive to this day. The Saxon settlement provided English county names, Essex, Middlesex, and Sussex, for East, Middle, and South Saxons. It's the language of Wessex, the kingdom of the West Saxons, that is still studied today. Of course, we no longer speak Old English, and it's often taught like a foreign language. But when you listen to it spoken, it doesn't sound foreign. It sounds oddly familiar. Uchtere was Walhunter. Uchtere was Walhunter. He was Swedish spadig man. He was Swedish spadig man. He was mit dem fürsten Mannum on them lande. He was mit dem fürsten Mannum on them lande. On them lande were on Finnas. On them lande were on Finnas. The Finnas were on Fischeras and Fugleras. The Finnas were on Fischeras and Fugleras. Ark Uchtere was Walhunter. Ark Uchtere was Walhunter. That land is Halgoland. That land is Halgoland. With overtones of modern Dutch and English, and especially German, 
Old English has familiar Germanic words like Kuning for king and Sprach for speak. The Kuning Athelbert and Wilde Augustina. And Sprach with Hina, that that is our Walde. Anyone who knows modern German will understand the basic principles of Old English and its structural difference from the English we speak today. The Old English for the king is Sir Kuning. Of the king is Thas Kuningus. To the king is Tham Kuninger. It's the endings which convey much of the grammar in an inflected language like Old English, not the prepositions. Take a simple Old English sentence like, the king meets the bishop. Sir Kuning meteth thon a bishop. Here, Sir Kuning is the subject of the sentence. Thon a bishop is the object. It's the form of the words, not word order, which give the sentence its meaning. In fact, if you change the word order, the meaning of the sentence remains the same. Thona bishop meteth Sir Kuning still means the king meets the bishop. Dr. Christopher Page of Oxford University has studied the music and poetry of the Anglo-Saxons. He points out that much of modern English comes from these first invaders. Many of the basic tools of our language, words like the, this, that, I, me, him, it, those are Anglo-Saxon words, which means that although we've lost a lot of vocabulary, in any passage of English, the density of words of Anglo-Saxon origin is likely to be quite high. And it's possible to construct sentences without particularly trying hard to do so, in which every word is of Anglo-Saxon origin. Page illustrates his point with a simple story of West Country life. Every single word you will hear is directly descended from Old English, as Page's translations show. The story is read for us by a forest ranger from the West Country named Edwin George. Deep in the heart of the old Saxon kingdom of Mercia lies the small hamlet of Butnog. Deer and other game thrive in this wooded land. Or, as they would have said in Old English, in Lamwoodigan land. I lived and worked here all my life. On leaf for me no eal. Towards the end of each year, I have to kill some of the deer which feed on the leafy shoots and brambles at night. On leafum, on bremlum, on nicht. About 90% of our commonest words come from Old English. Words like through, look, and slowly. Edwin's West Country accent also retains many echoes of Anglo-Saxon speech. He says book for buck, and he sounds his R's. Before the sun is high, I walk by fields and meadows. For felden and meadows. Where horses, cows, and sheep sometimes graze. Horse. On I go into Imperial Woods, Ford Dell's Brook, and find the deer. Deer on Finland. I follow them up a hill. For Hildes Rof. I walk very slowly now, so as not to frighten the game. That's Deor a Furchtan. And look out across a glade. Furchtan a wood to Lokian. Carefully sighting a buck. Buck can sail. I shoot. It shot you. The buck falls to the ground. Buck cafe left on ground. There will be a great deal of meat for my wife and children today. We for on children to die. The Anglo-Saxons were an agricultural people and mostly illiterate. But they had an ear for the music of the spoken word. 
and they love to recite poetry in the mead halls after feasting. Christopher Page believes that an old English vernacular masterpiece like Beowulf might have sounded something like this. Like many epics, it is full of metaphor and alliteration. The sea becomes a whale road, and the poet writes, Falling has felled a flowering kingdom. It reveals a reflective and ruminative temper of mind, a mind keenly, almost, well, almost obsessed with the transcendence of life, with heroism, with being dignified in the face of defeat and hopeless combat. Just off the coast of Northumbria is Holy Island, the site of the monastery of Lindisfarne. The conversion of England to Christianity was a cultural revolution which gave the language some of its incredible richness and power. The monks who illuminated these manuscripts here at Lindisfarne found their vocabulary enriched by gospel words from Latin and Greek. Words like altar, angel, martyr, and psalm. But in the year 793, this flowering of Anglo-Saxon culture was cut short by a second great invasion. This is how the beginning of the Dark Ages was recorded in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. There were terrible lightning storms. There were on Ormete Ligraskas. And fiery dragons flew through the air. And where on ye see on a furna drachen on them lift a fleogende. Heathen men sacked God's church at Lindisfarne. Heathen raman a hergung a diligod, goddes churican, in Lindisfarne. The Danes came year after year. By 870, all the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms had fallen. The English had been driven back to a small corner in the southwest, their language faced with extinction. The young king of Wessex in the south was England's last and only hope. He, of course, was Alfred the Great. Reduced to hiding in the marshes of Somerset with a small band of followers, Alfred showed brilliant leadership. He raised a new army and won a stunning victory over the Danes. By defeating the enemy from the north, and bringing peace to the south, Alfred saved not only his own kingdom, but also the English language. Now he set about uniting his people by appealing to a shared sense of Englishness. He commissioned the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle and encouraged the use of English for writing as well as speech. His achievement was unique in Europe and he is called the Great, an honor given to no other English monarch. England became divided along lines that are with us still. Alfred and his heirs ruled in the Saxon south. The Vikings settled north of a line agreed by treaty in the Danelaw. To this day, the north of England is richly carpeted with thousands of former Viking settlements. Even the fishing huts on Holy Island recall the shape of the Viking longships that, according to the chronicles, darkened the lives of the English with slaughter. The evidence of the Viking is everywhere, but one puzzle remains. Despite Viking rule, we know that Northerners speak English, not Danish, even though their countryside is still scattered with Norse names.
The evidence of the Viking is everywhere, but one puzzle remains. Despite Viking rule, we know that Northerners speak English, not Danish, even though their countryside is still scattered with Norse names. A thousand years later, near York, in the middle of the old Danelaw, the postman still delivers letters to places of Norse origin. Many of the names are based on simple Viking words. Toft for a plot of land, as in Lowestoft. Thwait, meaning a clearing, as in Micklethwait. Thorpe for a settlement, as in Gowthorpe or Yulethorpe. He passes the Beck, Viking for stream, into a village called Kirkby. B means a farm. Kirkby means the farm by the church. Today the postman is visiting a farmer of Norse descent named Erwin Bealby. The postman speaks with a typical Yorkshire accent. Hello, Erwin. How are you? How are you? Very well, and yourself? No, but middling. I don't like this cold weather. Erwin Bealby speaks a much older and stronger Yorkshire variety of English. What are you broke me this morning? You seem to have a fairish layer of stuff. Yeah, well, there's a variety, in there. This feels like a beer. Oh, well, I'll let you up with and see, aren't I? That is you, I'm middling a walk to the Irish, so I'll let you get on. See, see you. It's very difficult talking folks dialect because they don't know what you're talking about. I mean, you've only to take village that I live in. And there, uh, there's that many fresh folks come to live in, come out at towns, you know, and what, what we call off Cumdens. And the grand folks, but of course there isn't jobs for folks around here, and they're, uh, they go to work at towns, into city, into York. And, uh, of course, if you were to talk to them in dialect, they wouldn't know what the world you were talking about. Erwin Bealby's conversation is riddled with Viking words, like adl, meaning to earn. You're going to uh, do a job, because you want to earn some money. You want to adl some brass, as we would say in Yorkshire. Mon, it means you must. And laub, well, it means to jump. Laub toward yacht. Jump over the gate. A stop is a gate post, you see. Well, your, her bag, is the udder of a milking cow. Milk cow. To team is emptying, pouring, or anything, you see. You team your book, it into its sile. It's a strainer, is sile. You sit on a little three legs still and get your head stuck into it hard, cool sad. By God, it was a grand job on a frosty morning. Erwin's surname, Bealby, is Norse, but he actually lives in Bolton, which is Anglo-Saxon. Names ending in ton, like Malton and Pocklington, are typically Saxon. So are place names ending in Wick, Ing, Ford, and Burra, as in Pulborough. Like the Viking names, Anglo-Saxon endings are also descriptive. Tun was an enclosure. Ham was a town. Stead meant a site. Stowe, a place, often religious. And Wold meant a hill. Both the Anglo-Saxon and Viking place names of the Danelaw have traveled across the English-speaking world to places like Scarborough in Canada, Derby in Australia, to Boston in America, or Wellington, New Zealand. Here in Yorkshire, the postman's mixed bag is a clue to what happened to the language in England when Viking and Saxon lived side by side. Professor Tom Shippey is a Yorkshireman who is fluent in Old Norse and Old English. He has studied what happened when the two languages came face to face. We're up here where Wharfdale meets Langstrothdale. It's a very mixed area linguistically. You get pure English names like Buckton and pure Norse names like Starbottom. 
and you get mixtures like Kettlewell or Hubberholm or Jochenthwaite. It's so mixed and they're so close to each other, it makes you wonder what language they were talking in this valley back there a thousand years ago when the Norse were beginning to come in. Consider what happens if Jochen's son from Jochenthwaite, call him Rap, comes down the valley and decides to marry an English girl from Buckden, call her Edith, and they decide to set up home over there near Hubberholm. Rap's a Norse speaker, Edith is an English speaker. What language are they going to talk in the farm? It could get very awkward to use a Norse term. And then suppose that Rap and Edith want to buy a horse for their cart. In Old English, cart was wyan, from which we get the traditional haywain. Rap, who is Norse, who is a husband, that's a Norse word, and his wife uh, Edith, wife being an English word, uh, they have a neighbour, comes from Buckton, and he's English, and he's called Edgar, and he decides to sell Rap a horse. And uh, Edgar comes up to Rap, and he says to him in English, it's willa they sell an, that horse that draggeth me a wine. Now Rap, if he was going to say that, would say something rather similar. He would say, Ekmun sell ya there, prosit, sem dreger vogen mean. Now, Rapp and Edgar have no great problem here on words. Rapp says wagen, and uh, Edgar says wine. Rapp says cross, and Edgar says horse. Rapp and Edgar's confusion is essentially based on one thing. It's all a question of word endings. Rapp says crossit for one horse, but crossin for two horses. Edgar says that horse for one horse, but the horse for the plural. It's all a question of word endings. Rap says crossit for one horse, but crossin for two horses. Edgar says that horse for one horse, but the horse for the plural. And it's very striking that what modern English has decided to do about it is to drop the whole problem. Instead of having all this that, the, in, it business, we just say the for everything. We don't attempt to change it at all. And similarly, when it comes to plurals, instead of having a system as you had in, in proper Old English, where you said stan, stanas, horse, horse, ship, shipu, boke, beach, we scrap the whole thing and we say stone stones, horse horses, ship ships, book books. So when Viking and Saxon met face to face, English achieved the first of its great simplifying compromises. After the expulsion of the Celts, it was one of the most significant steps in the evolution of modern English. Well, there's an irony in all this, I think, and the irony is this. If you looked round in the year 1000 and said, where are the centers of power for the language, you might say it's in London where the king is, or it's in Winchester where they have the trained scribes and the people writing manuscripts. But actually, the place where the language was developing in the direction that was going to be modern English was places like this. The ancestor of modern English is created in places like Wharfdale. Shippy's argument that English not only survived, but triumphed, is supported by some persuasive evidence here in Kirkdale, North Yorkshire. In about the year 1000, some Viking settlers set about repairing this little church. In the porch is a sundial. The man who commissioned the work has the resoundingly Viking name Orm Gamelson. But on closer inspection, his inscription turns out to be in Old English. Barely 100 years after his people invaded, Orm Gamelson is writing in the language of his former enemies. The power of English to stand up to invasion, war, and social upheaval faced the supreme test in 1066. Harold Godwinson was to be the last English-speaking king for nearly 300 years. 
the third and most famous invasion in this story began in France. Duke William of Normandy assembled a fleet and launched his forces across the Channel. In the words of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, then William, Earl of Normandy, came to Pevensey. Da kom Wilhelm, Earl of Normandie, into Pevensey. Harold the King gathered then a great army. Harold the King gathered the Mikkel Naher. William came against him unawares before his people were assembled. Wilhelm him come on yean, on unware, ere his folk he fulked were. There were slain King Harold and many good men, and the French wielded power over that place of slaughter. There were for slacken Harold the King, and fell a good man, and the Frankish can act on, well store your world. The word castle comes from French, and this was now the language spoken by the Norman knights in their English strongholds. As one chronicler put it, when England fell into Norman hands, they spoke French as they did at home. Thus come though England into Normandy's hand, and the Normans ne couth the speaker, the butter ur speech, and speaker French as they do at home, and here children did also teach. William tried to learn English at the age of 43, but was too busy to keep it up. Many Anglo-Norman kings were often totally ignorant of their country's language. Edward III could use English only for swearing. Government, law, and administration were conducted in French. And so was the English church. In the great cathedrals like Durham, the Normans slowly purged the English-speaking bishops. Next to French, Latin was the language of clerks and clergy. In the year 1155, the English monks who wrote the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle abandoned their work forever. Going by the written record, English seems to have become obliterated. But some scholars, like Michael Clancy, challenged the view that Anglo-Norman society was wholly French-speaking. Scholars have perhaps been misled because we are taught and learn to respect writings, and of course that is what has survived, these masses of writings, whereas speech has been lost. There's good evidence here, says Clanchy, that the Normans became quickly integrated into English society. A contemporary of around 1180 says that by that time, the Normans and English were so intermarried as to be indistinguishable. Imagine an Anglo-Norman knight living out in the English countryside, far from the influence of the French-speaking court. He might have married an English wife. Their children would grow up speaking English. Their nursemaids would probably speak English. Out in the fields, his serfs could speak only in English. In the local monastery, the monks would speak English, and so would the humble parish priest. Clanchy can demonstrate, in fact, that by 1250, Anglo-Norman children were learning French like a foreign language. You can show from 1250, from a knight called Walter of Bibsworth, wrote a book designed for English-speaking people to show them how to speak French. And so French was a language which educated people could speak, but I think it was, a, by and large, a learned language. The surviving sermons and prayers show that in some ways English had remained largely unchanged. 
One hundred years before the Norman invasion, the Lord's Prayer sounded like this. Ure Vader, do de Eart von Heofenum, si din a name, ihr Halgon. Two hundred years after the invasion, the Lord's Prayer sounded like this. Ure Vader, dat Art in Hevenes, hallowed be di name. Clanchy has found startling new evidence that English didn't die out as a written language. This document contains the first known example of written English in a government document after the conquest. In the old script, the word looks like hamlet, but it's actually nameless, meaning pointless. The French of the castles and the Latin of the churches did not touch the structure of English. But the Normans did have a huge impact on its vocabulary. The Norman masters contributed a wealth of synonyms to the language. Before the Normans, there was one word, kingly. Now the language was enriched with royal, regal, and sovereign. This capacity to express fine distinctions now became one of the hallmarks of the English language. The Norman conquest was a linguistic blessing in disguise. From its French overlords, English acquired a rich variety of new vocabularies for art, learning, medicine, and high fashion. In the law, French supplied virtually all the commonly used terms, felony, assault, larceny, perjury, plaintiff, defendant, judge and jury, even attorney. The same was true for the monarchy, the church and the military, all areas of power and authority. So great indeed is our debt to the Normans that a mischievous Frenchman once suggested that English should be known as a dialect of French. English gained a staggering 10,000 new words from the Normans. These twin traditions, Saxon and Norman, have given us a vocabulary at least twice as large as French, Spanish, Italian, or German. So anyone who writes and speaks in English has a vast menu of words to choose from. Sir Walter Scott pointed out that a medieval banquet could be described in a whole alternative vocabulary. Chicken could be poultry, Deer could be venison, sheep could be mutton, calves could be veal. To this day, the use of French words has a certain snob value, suggesting sophistication or savoir-faire. The structure of the language was changing, too. Sir Kuning is now the king. Plas Kuningus is now of the king. Pham Kuninger is now to the king. So the first big difference between Old English and this emerging Middle English is in the use of prepositions, words like of and to, instead of word endings. Without word endings, word order becomes crucial. The king meets the bishop. Change the order of these words, and you change the whole meaning of the sentence. The bishop meets the king. This was the English, Frenchified and Latinized, spoken around the year 1350 by the courtiers, merchants, and scholars of the capital. They gave this prestige variety an automatic superiority, the beginnings of standard English. And here we see them listening to perhaps the first great writer in English literature, Geoffrey Chaucer, author of the Canterbury Tales. Here beginneth the book of the Tales of Canterbury. Quan that April, with his surest sota, the drucht of March hath persed to the rota, and bathed every vine in such liqueur, of which virtue engendered is the floor. Then longen folk to go on pilgrimages. 
Chaucer is one of the writers of genius on whom English has always depended for its imaginative breakthroughs. He wrote about all classes of men and women, the knight, the priest, the prioress, and the wife of Bath. Chaucer was alive to the potential of English. He pokes fun at Yorkshire accents, he dazzles the reader with wordplay, and he mocks the pretensions of people who claim to know French and Latin. Chaucer was the first English writer to be buried in Westminster Abbey. It's ironic that Chaucer's tomb is inscribed in Latin because he is the first writer of genius in our story who consciously chose the English language as the medium for his inspiration. In his early years, according to the fashion of the day, he had worked in Latin and French. It was a bold, almost avant-garde decision to write in English, and his success gave a new authority to the mother tongue. Listening to recordings of Chaucer's English, we can hear that though the vocabulary is essentially the same, the pronunciation is still different. I'd stand by studio and we'll try a take. Uh, line 180, please, Mary. Okay. Can, we, can mm -hmm. we start from there? there? There was also a nun. Take it quite steadily. OK, whenever you're ready. OK. There was also a nun near, Prioresse, that of his smiling was full simple and coy. Here Greta's de Us was but by Saint Eloy. The first one is, uh, is the word nun. Mm -hmm. And the vowel sound at this time must have been oh, so it should be that it was also a nun. A nun. A nun. There was also a nun, a prioressa, that of her smiling was full simple and coy. Well, well, that was it needs to be was. needs to go was. It's not it was. was. Yes. That of her smiling was full simple and coy. Her greatest oath was but be sent alloy. And she was clepped Madame Eglantina. She, of course, should be she. The vowel uh, in he and she is an a, not an, she. Not an a. She. She. Mm. She spak full fear, fire. fire, and fetisly. After the school of Stratford at a boa. I think that's very good, no? <laughs> Indeed, it's pretty good, yes. So it's Mary next, please. There was also a nun, a prioress, that of her smiling was full simple and coy. Her greatest oath was but be signed a loy, and she was clepped Madame Eglantine. The father of English literature stands at the head of a great tradition, which includes many of the writers honored here especially men like John Dryden and Samuel Johnson, and of course, William Shakespeare. As it happened, some 75 years after Chaucer's death, it was right here within the precincts of Westminster Abbey that the man who published much of Chaucer's work, England's first printer, set up his press. And that was William Caxton. This is Caxton's own work. The first page of the first book ever printed in the English language. Here in the Weald of Kent, Caxton's birthplace, Graham Williams is a printer in the same tradition. He works with a Caxton-style hand press, and also the laborious pen and ink method replaced by the printing revolution a cornerstone of the Renaissance. He imagines that Caxton was a rather contemporary character. I think he was a remarkably good businessman. That was his training. That's really what his life was about until he was about 50 years old. I think in his day, he was probably a very modern man. I think he would have had an eye to moving up the social ladder just a bit. And I'm quite certain that he was looking at the new technology. He would have dealt with books that were handwritten. Suddenly printing came along. I think it must have intrigued him. The idea of multiplying copies. 
But when the first printing press began to roll in England, Caxton faced a problem. In an oral culture, the few who could write tended to spell as they spoke. There were variant spellings for almost every English word. Besides, there were at least five distinct varieties of English, an evolution of the Old English language map. In the north was Northern English. In the south, the English of Alfred the Great's Old Kingdom. In Kent, there was the separate variety of the southeast. The Midlands were divided east and west. This is remarkably similar to the Saxon map, and it still holds good today. Within the East Midlands itself, one small nucleus of power, trade, and learning shared the same kind of English. The triangle formed by Oxford, Cambridge, and London is the basis of standard English in the 20th century. When it came to setting Chaucer in the new type, Caxton had to settle for one system. Naturally, he adopted the vocabulary and spelling of the capital, London English. Like all his contemporaries, Caxton himself was an idiosyncratic speller who wrote as he spoke. This is his spelling of girl. Words like write reflect the pronunciation of the time, richt. And so does plough, ploch, a word that even Caxton spells two different ways. The English language owes its chaotic spelling conventions to this simple fact that printers, like Caxton, fixed the language on the page before a consensus had emerged among its writers and teachers. It was around Caxton's time that English pronunciation went through its last great change. By the late 15th century, English is almost totally recognizable in the mouths of the first professional actors. You could, in fact, imagine holding a conversation with them in the street. Worshipful sovereigns, join voices with us to summon the devil to Tivolus. Clear pass, and who should bring him in with a shout? To Tivolus. To Tivolus. To Tivolus. This is Mankind, one of the most popular plays of the 15th century in an authentic performance outside the porch of Lincoln Cathedral. Ego sum dominantium dominus. And me nam. Is titivalus. Do we. He shall know more over the church steel. Here, the yeah, devil prepares to tempt mankind, a hard-working peasant, to swear an oath of loyalty to the seven the deadly sins. Oh, but heat is very heavy. He tell you for so. He shall sleep full my belly, though he be my brother. Farewell, every son, for he have done me gone, for he have brought mankind to mischief and to sham. <laughs> Mankind, come hither. And raise your lift hog. You shall go to all the good fellows in the country about. On to the good whip when the good man is out. <laughs> he will, sir, yeah. He will, sir. There are but six deadly sinners. Lechery is known, as might be very feared Bill's breath, Ellis, every John. You must go rob, steal, and kill. As 
fast as you might go. And it will, say ye. Uh, it will, sir. Tack the money, kick the throttles, thus over fast them. It will, say ye. Uh, it will, sir. Here is a jolly jacket. Woo! Mankind is a colloquial masterpiece, funny, high-spirited, and original. And the language is at last recognizably English. Emerging from the shadow of French and Latin, it's exploiting the versatility it has acquired during the previous 1,000 years. Highly colored, playful, and self-confident, the English language has come of age. After this triumphant debut, the stage is now set for the English of William Shakespeare and the Elizabethans.